So I'm just gonna run through our background and objectives of this project, the experimental design, some brief uh, significant findings and then conclusions. And if I don't get time to, to uh, answer your question at the end of this, you can email me at the following email in the, the lower right corner here, marsh at iastate.edu. And you can follow our research. Um, and really, I, I just get the easy job of presenting it here, all the students and postdocs that are doing some fantastic research on soils and or streams or plants. And this is the postdoc, uh, former postdoc, now assistant professor in biology at Minnesota State University that did all the hard work on this project. Okay, so let's see if I can get this out of the way. I always forget how to uh, hide this. I think that's it, right? No. <laughs> Again, sorry for the technical, there we go. Okay, so what limits algae growth in streams or what, what we think of as the first stages of eutrophication? We know from some experiments that go back to the 1970s in experimental lakes where they've artificially added nutrients, nitrogen or phosphorus, and, and looked at al algae production, which is kind of the first stage of eutrophication. Then that algae dies, creates a, a, a demand for oxygen as, as that algal growth starts to decompose. Um, this is a, a large, very comprehensive study done in these experimental lakes. It's difficult to do these nutrient additions in streams. Um, however, there are other kind of creative ways that people have found like this um, in-situ nutrient enrichment experiment with these uh, uh, overturned uh, planters, these terracotta planters that they impregnated with nutrients to see how algae growed on, grew on these. And this is a, a study actually from Iowa State uh, by some researchers that are, uh, I assume are retired now, um, but this was done back in 1987. So um, we've been studying what limits algae growth in streams for quite some time. And unfortunately, we haven't come to a, a complete consensus. Both nitrogen and phosphorus can limit algae in aquatic ecosystems sometimes. And there was a, a nice paper by Dodds and Smith in 2016 that shows that Maybe the combination of both nutrients can limit algae growth as assessed here with chlorophyll A. And that's one of the measures we're, I'm gonna talk about here. Um, but the, the, the consensus is that, you know, there are all these other factors besides the nutrient availability that can limit growth. And we know that, that um, there's, a link, there's probably a linkage between soil management and in-stream eutrophication. And this is kind of my logic as follows. Uh, we know that management practices affect nutrient leaching from tile drain studies that Matt and many others have done uh, around the state of Iowa, where we can collect water from these tile lines. So this is, uh, so most of you in the audience will know what this, uh, uh, this tile drained uh, system is. We can insert these tiles at a depth three to four feet and drains the water table. We can produce more crops, but this also exports water and nutrients through two streams, like this one I show in the upper right corner or that stream that I had worked in when I was a master's student at University of Illinois. And this map on the right, many of you have probably also seen with the tile drainage proportion um, in the Midwest. And we're in kind of a hot spot here in uh, north or central and north central Iowa. Um, there are also some hot spots of tile drainage indicated by the darker blue color out in um, uh, Michigan and Ohio as well, Indiana a bit and Illinois. So our major questions when we approach this project and this grant was, does the prior stream condition, so imagine we have a pristine stream versus maybe a, a stream that has been under uh, a nutrient load for a longer time, would uh, management changes in that watershed affect these uh, a different legacy of, of nutrient or di streams differently that maybe come from a different legacy of nutrients. And this is sometimes called, so I think I bring sometimes my, my soil brain to studying streams and in soils, this is sometimes referred to as soil memory or the legacy effect that's kind of built up the conditions in that stream. And yes, streams are quite different. There's a, a larger mass of, of water moving through it than a soil. But maybe uh, that was one question that we, we were attempting to answer with this project. The second or the third question um, is that, does the mixing volume alter this relationship? So 
Here's an example up in the right corner where we've got a, a tile drain field and there's, um, you know, maybe uh, a trickle of water compared to the, the stream itself. So the, the mixing or how much tile water is intercepting the total stream probably alters eutrophication and algae growth. And so our objectives were to compare the impact of tile water under different uh, conservation practices versus a business as usual management and how that affects stream water eutrophication. It's difficult to set up an experiment like this because you'd have to, you'd have to change the entire catchment or watershed uh, uh, land use to the same land use in order to create experimental units to test this. So this was kind of our ambitious question. And additionally, in addition to that, that's our main factor. We we're interested in does the prior history of nutrients that I mentioned, that legacy effect, you know, whether a stream is pristine and has had low nutrient load for a long period of time, or it's a high, what we call a high impacted stream, higher uh, nutrient concentrations, nutrient loads. And then also the mixing volume, as I just mentioned, you, we were interested in you know, uh, mixing the stream water and tile water in different ratios and see how that affected eutrophication. So we had three main hypotheses. One, that tile water from conservation management practices, so that including a cereal rye cover crop or restored prairie will decrease eutrophication compared to a conventional corn soybean rotation. And, and I'll, I'll show the uh, kind of experimental setup in a bit. Um, and then our hypothesis was that streams without a prior history of excess nutrients, these would be the pristine, less than maybe one milligram of um, nit nitrogen per liter would be more sensitive to eutrophication than streams regularly showing high nutrient concentrations. Our kind of cutoff was five milligrams per liter for that. And then that greater mixing volumes, more tile water relative to stream water will also exacerbate eutrophication. We're assuming at least in the pristine stream case that there's a greater relative uh, concentration. And so this is kind of a, 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 a cartoon of, of how we set this up. So we worked with uh, Michael Thompson, Matt Helmers and others, Grace Wilkinson. Um, she's now at University of Wisconsin to uh, set up this experiment. And we uh, collected water from the Cobbs uh, long-term uh, biofuel cropping system experiment. So we collected it from the corn soybe soybean rotation, the corn soybean with a cereal rye and, corn and the restored prairie. Um, and we use the re restored prairie with nutrients, I believe. And we assume that the, the, the business and usual, the nutrient leaky system would have more nitrogen phosphorus in, in the tile water. This has been documented by uh, Matt's group than the restored prairie, which has less nitrogen and phosphorus. So that's already been documented. But what we did is we found three streams within those categories, low impacted, less than five parts per million over a five year record one that was medium, five to 10, and then one that was high. So greater than 10 parts per million of nitrogen um, uh, averaging throughout a, a five year period. And so from blue, so left to right, low impacted to more impacted. And then we mixed those tile water sources with the stream water sources. And we had a couple different mixing ratios. We had a 5% mixing ratio, a 10%, of tile water to um, stream water and 25, where that'd be like a deluge of nutrients, right? So, you know, more of a trickle, 5%, medium, 10%, 25% would be uh, uh, a larger proportion of, of um, the tile water uh, uh, in the stream. This is just an example of the high impacted stream. This was uh, near Hubbard, Iowa, Tipton Creek. And you could see the nitrate concentration in the, the three years prior to our collecting the sample. So this is how we determine the high impacted stream. We found the low and medium as well. I, I don't have time to show all those, but that was where one of our uh, water sources came from. So then what we did, we, after we mixed those proportions of the tile water and stream water, we incubated, uh, well, first we, shake, we shook the, gently shook the soil or I'm so used to soil, can't even think of streams now. Um, we shook the stream water and tile water gently. Um, and then we, we uh, uh, before the incubation, we measured and analyzed for chlorophyll A. So this is kind of the T0 
using microplate reader method, and then also measured dissolved oxygen using a probe. Then we incubated for 14 days in a growth chamber um, at a 12 to 12 hour dark light cycle. So optim this basic, think of it as like uh, optimum algae growing conditions, right? So this is kind of the potential for eutrophication. And then we did the same thing. We pulled those samples out of the, our growth chamber and then analyzed for chlorophyll A as, a, a, as, as, as an increase uh, in algae and then measured the drop in dissolved, dissolved oxygen that would be associated with eutrophication. This is what the experiment looked like. Murgako took these uh, uh, great photos here. Um, so he randomized where the mixtures were and, and how they're laid out. Uh, just covered them with parafilm or maybe uh, some saran wrap. And then you can see up in the upper right, one of the jars that had some paraphytic algae growing at the, the base of the jar. And then what he would do is he'd measure the dissolved oxygen first, uh, stir the jar, mix, you know, try to detach the algae from the jar and then filter it through uh, filter paper, which is shown in the bottom right. Okay, so that's a bit about the methods. Now, what did we find? Um, so in a nutshell, we found that there's complex interactions on the drop in dissolved oxygen, but only main effects on the chlorophyll A or the, the growth in algae, the proxy which we're using for algae growth. Um, and here's, here's kind of for all of you statistical junkies out there, these were our main factors, tile water, stream water, the mixing ratio, and then the interactions. So we had significant interactions all the way down the board, including a, a three-way interaction, which is tough to, to deal with sometimes. And then with chlorophyll A, we only had um, the main effects. So I'm gonna show the main effects of that. And then um, for some reason, the, the, um, the three-factor I'm gonna show uh, with um, the dissolved oxygen. So let's start, this is a, a complex graph, but let me walk you through it. On the bottom or the x-axis is the first organized by the stream. So low impacted, medium, and high impacted. Then we have our mixing ratios, five, 10, 25%. And then the color bars are no cover crop. So business as usual, cover crop in kind of the lighter color. And then the prairie is the lightest. So with chlorophyll A, we saw that the cover crop and prairie nearly decrease algae growth by the same amount, near between 40 to 46%. And this is a percent increase from the T0 to the T14 at day 14. The other thing we found is that low impacted streams are more sensitive to tile water by about 100%. So there's more algae growth, as we had hypothesized in the low impacted streams compared to the ones that are more seeing we're more regularly seeing high nutrient loads, right? Now this is where it gets complicated. So bear with me here. This is the dissolved oxygen. And so uh, unlike the algae, greater, uh, so a larger bar is uh, uh, worse, right? Because it means more algae growth. Now a lower bar, more negative uh, in the opposite direction because that up in dissolved oxygen that might actually impact aquatic uh, uh, life. And so the main thing we found here is that the cover crop and, um, and restored prairie reduce the DO drop. Um, streams with high nutrients were, were more sensitive. And then one really unusual finding we found was that the mixing ratio mattered and that at a 10% mixing ratio, the results were inverse. So in other words, the prairie dropped the oxygen more, an indicator of eutrophication, than the business as usual, no cover crop corn soybean system. Really scratching our head on that it might be related to the stoichiometry, sto stoichiometry of nutrients or proportion of carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. And we measured those and we're still analyzing the data. But the main conclusions are that conservation practices reduce eutrophication, more complex than just more nutrients, more eutrophication, right? I showed with the uh, complex interactions. The low impacted streams are more sensitive. The source of tile water prior to um, uh, I, I, the prior stream conditions and the prior stream, stream conditions and the mixing ratio were all important in regulating that dissolved oxygen. So the uh, drop in DO is quite complex. And as I, I mentioned, the stoichiometry, we're delving into that and, um, and balance of nutrients and other 
possible factors that might explain some of our unusual findings, but also the ones that were more uh, predictable. And, and here's a picture of Morganco shown here sampling off the bridge. I was just talking to Alejandro how we sample the water here. So he was using a, a drop bucket sampler. And I'd just like to th thank the I INRC again for funding for this. Morganca and a, a team of other collaborators on that. And um, I guess we're doing questions afterwards. So I'm going to hand it over to Alejandro. All right. Thank you very much, Marshall. Um, can you hear me well? Okay. Uh, so please let us know if uh, sound is an issue. Um, I want to thank the Iowa Nutrient Research Center for uh, inviting me to make this presentation that is based on research and uh, research actually funded by the INRC uh, not so long ago. And um, a team, we had a great team of collaborators, Marshall among them, William Sawargo, now is at Auburn, uh, Wenong Zhang, now at Cornell, Jim Jensen with uh, the American Society of Farm Managers and Rural Appraisers, and Sarah Carlson with Practical Farmers of Iowa. So the topic today uh, is um, the major barriers I see uh, for monetizing soil health. So let's start with uh, a slide I borrowed from Marshall on the principles of soil health and how these uh, principles are really tied to specific practices that can be applied. Uh, and you can see how cover crops and no-till or reduced till are really major drivers uh, or major contributors to these uh, principles of soil health in crop production, right? So we can focus on those practices as um, drivers or you know, enhancers of soil health and uh, we can think that with all the attention that those practices received in the last decade or so, we could see, or we should be seeing um, increased adoption of both practices all across the nation. Well, that's not the case. If we look at the census data, those red areas in these maps are actually reflecting this adoption or a negative change in the number of acres by county in cover crops, in the graph on the left, and in no-till in the graph on the right. So although Iowa is doing much better than other uh, states, you can see that there's a lot of red in those two maps. So why aren't we seeing all the increases that we would expect in no-till adoption and and cover crop adoption. Well, there's plenty of research here in Iowa and Midwest showing that cover crops um, do not always generate positive um, private returns to farmers. And uh, I have to highlight here the word private returns because uh, we know that they are associated with plenty of social positive returns. Uh, yeah, is uh, there uh, for most of uh, the farmers that we interviewed or surveyed, unless, of course, there's some cost share involved and even better cost share and grazing livestock involved. So Most uh, studies will conclude that the average expected net return uh, to farmers from cover cropping in Iowa and in the Midwest uh, is negative. And that's despite very lofty subsidies. Uh, $5 million per year um, pay idle to Iowa farmers and in larger sums in other states. So what are the criticisms that we find when we present these kind of results? Well, people tell us that economic studies actually fail to capture changes in soil organic matter over the long run. 
and the associated improvement in soil health, water quality, and land value. And therefore, these results are easily disqualified. Well, let's analyze each of these criticisms one by one, right? Soil health, uh, increase in soil health should actually increase the private benefit to the farmer through higher yields, less soil erosion, and they are both accounted for in all these economic studies. How about water quality? Well, that's a societal benefit and does not change the profitability analysis for the farmer. So unless we start discussing fines to polluters, which we don't want to do. So uh, water quality is out of the equation for now. How about land values and conservation practices affecting land values in the long term? Well, that's the area that we felt could be addressed through this research project. project. And our goal was to evaluate whether and how rural appraisers incorporate fertility and soil health test results into their appraisal reports. Now, why did we focus on rural appraisers? Well, because they are usually the ones that put a value to farmland. And although farmland is not always transacted at the price set by an appraiser, the appraised value usually serves as an anchor in the negotiation between seller and buyer um, at a certain point in time. So our, our hypothesis was that if we had land with long-term conservation practices, uh, that would generate or be associated with higher soil fertility and soil health, and that would translate into higher land values. And we actually hired nine certified appraisers to appraise three farms in Washington County. Washington County is first in the state in terms of cover crop adoption and 21st in um, terms of no-till adoption. So the first farm is characterized by long-term no-till and no cover crops. The second farm is characterized by long-term no-till and cover crops. And the third farm is just a conventional tillage and no cover crops farm. We provided fake soil results to the appraisers and concealed information about the long-term practices. Our hypothesis that was that better fertility and soil test results would be, would be reflected into higher land values. And we used manipulation here. We actually uh, thought that true long-term conservation practices would result in higher soil test, in, in better soil uh, test results that we artificially created for this project. So what we shared with the appraisers were fake uh, soil test results. And uh, the important thing was that we had three groups of appraisers um, with three appraisers in each group. And uh, one group of appraisers um, did not receive any training on soil health or soil fertility. Another group, the gold group received um, training on fertility, but not soil health metrics. And the red group received training um, from Marshall and Sarah and, um, and Jim Jensen on uh, soil health and soil fertility in October 19. So we had them um, create appraisal reports for these three farms in uh, April 2019, and then again in March 2020, the same farms, so pre and post training. So we had a total of 54 appraisal reports um, to look at. Let's take a look at the values first. So, because that explains um, a few things when we tied those numbers to the characteristics of the farm beyond the long-term uh, conservation practices. So the first farm is the longer no-till farm, right? But it's not just that, in comparison to farm two and three, it's a larger farm of 105 acres, and it has a higher CSR2, a higher um, um, corn suitability rating than the other two. So it's more productive. The price value there is higher in both years than for the other two farms. Um, when we look at the mean difference across years, so pre and post training, um, there's a minimal difference. It's statistically significant of about $500, but too many things were happening at that time. We had COVID hit and um, uh, the reality is that you know, 
although statistically significant, it's uh, not a large difference in valuation between 2019 and 2020. Now, the second farm has a much lower mean appraised value of 6,628 and 6,668 uh, for each year, but it's a smaller farm, 73 acres, and a smaller, about uh, 58 CSR2 um, index. Um, and in this case, the difference between years was not significant. Now, the third farm, uh, I'm sorry, I must have uh, mentioned that, I should have mentioned that the second farm is again, no-till and cover crops, long-term, practices in no-till and cover crop. The third farm is just a conventional um, tillage farm, uh, no cover crops uh, over the past 10 years. So, uh, and it had a similar CSR2 uh, number as the, uh, the second farm, and it was slightly smaller than the second farm. But the values you see there, 6,900 and 7,000, are not very different from the previous one. Now, when we want to uh, analyze the contrast by groups of, um, of appraisers, and let me try to hide this um, there, okay. Um, we can generate contrast for farm one versus farm two. And of course, farm one is larger and it has a higher CSR2 number, um, higher potential productivity, so it's more valuable than the second farm. And the, the differences are statistically significant for each of the groups and for the overall. When we compare farm one with farm three, again, we see statistically significant differences, uh, which makes sense. But when we compare the farm two with the third farm, so the farm with no-till and cover crops against the conventional farm with about the same productivity index, and uh, slightly sim I would say similar farm sizes, the differences in appraised values are not statistically significant uh, in general. Um, it is for one group um, and in 2019 and overall for 2020, but the difference is really, really uh, small in, in dollar terms. Okay. But that's the quantitative part. I want to share with you also the qualitative part. So in the appraisal reports, you know, these are 100 page or 50 or 60 some, sometimes, but very long reports. Um, and uh, for each team, we asked from them different things uh, in, the, in the set of instructions that we sent to each team. For the blue team, we did not ask them to use soil test results, and they did not receive any training. So, as expected, they, uh, none of them, um, none of those three appraisers, used test results to adjust appraised values in 2019 or 2020. For the gold team, we encouraged them to use test results, um, pre-training and post-training, so 2019 and 2020, and in 2019 none of them use test results to adjust appraised values. Although two of them mentioned indirectly uh, or directly the soil test results, but nothing uh, was incorporated into the analysis. Now, post training in October, 2019, the members of the gold team actually looked at the test results and all of them mentioned some comments into the in the uh, appraisal reports. So let's take a look at them. Uh, the first one said the soil test results were furnished for a subject farm. The same soils information was not available for the sale farms, which did not allow a comparison. So uh, appraisers used comparable farms to put a value to a specific farm. So they, uh, this person was complaining that uh, he could not use the um, the results because there were no comparables. The other appraiser um, mentioned that this appraiser is not aware of where these soil samples were taken on this farm. So um, he would have wanted more information on the location where the soil sampling had taken place. And the third one indicate that, indicated that soil tests shows a very high rate of organic matter 
whether a buyer would pay a premium for this is unknown because the appraiser does not have the comparable soil tests as a comparison. So they are all complaining about the same lack of benchmarks, let's say. And of course, none of them use the test results to adjust the appraised values. Now the red team, they, this uh, group received a longer training, a three hour training. They received credits from the American uh, Society of Farm Managers and Rural Appraisers, three uh, educational credits. And um, in 2019, uh, on, there was only one mention, this was, this was pre-training. The only mention that we received uh, was uh, about the, no, the, the lack of a need to consider soil quality or farming efficiency in the selection of the capitalization rate because capitalization rates already included um, um, indirect measures of soil quality and farming efficiency. So nobody used that in 2019 of this group, the red team. And Post training, again, they were encouraged to use the test results. In this case, they all mentioned the uh, soil test, but none adjusted the appraised values. And let's see the comments. This information was not available for any of the sales. Therefore, no adjustments were made. The general consensus is that while soil health is receiving increased interest, particularly no-till and cover crop use, at this time, there is not significant data to show market participants using this information to determine sale or purchase price. The other comment was data on organic matter content and fertility was not available for the comparables. And it's almost impossible to translate the value of soil health of, on the comparables to value of the subject property. So our conclusions besides the quantitative uh, results is that Rural appraisers need to follow strict rules to appraise farmland based on comparable sales, income approach to value, and cost approach to value. If they deviate from those rules, they lack, they risk losing their, their certification. So in the end, land is traded on CSR2, uh, which was an index developed for tax purposes and does not allow for an adjustment on soil quality. So Currently, that's a major barrier to monetizing soil health. Current practices do not allow for adjustments based on soil health or soil fertility. And if we want to remove this barrier, then we can think about creating a database of soil health and fertility test results to attach to comparable sales. And we need to educate rural appraisers on that topic and uh, how they can use that information to reflect soil resiliency. And we can do a better job at the research and extension community to show the linkages between long-term cover crop and no-till to soil health fertility test for different CSR2 levels. So with that, I will conclude my presentation and invite uh, questions and comments for both Marshall and I. Yeah, we, have, we should have plenty of time for questions for either Marshall or Alejandro. So. Um, somebody can monitor if anybody has them on the chat box. I'm actually not sure which microphone they're picking up. So, uh, but uh, are there any questions in the room? And then we'll see if there are any come online. I have one, uh, Alejandra, on the, the last one here. Um, I guess having gone through this, um, you think they're kind of your last slides uh, are on uh, kind of the uh, educate that you think the rural appraisers are ready for education on some of these for, would be receptive to education on soil health and fertility tests? Well, based on our experience, I think they would be if the demand for that is there. So if consumers, uh, if uh, landowners, uh, buyers and sellers of land are interested in, in that, they will, um, take the educational credits, they will, um, they are interested in implementing this change in practice. Yes. And I have one for Marshall too. Uh, your streams, you, Tipton Creek was the high impacted stream. What was, where'd you find the low, the low, the low impacted stream in Iowa? Yeah, if I had more time, I have slides for both of those. Yeah. So the, the low impacted was near Dubuque. Oh, okay. Yeah, near Dubuque, uh, right. and Catfish Creek. 
and the, the nitrate or the nitrate plus nitrite was below three over the, that three year time period okay. the entire time. Below three. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, I have a question. I suppose it's going to be more partial. Um, so if we're building up a database on soil health, the boundaries on soil health are pretty easy. I won't say controversial is not the right word, but it's, there's no consensus what that, what that is. Really. Uh, how would you start that moving ahead? Yeah, kind of getting at that first. So I think the question was kind of uh, first steps to creating any database on soil health. And, you know, it kind of goes at um, that first bullet point that Alejandro has there on, you know, create a database, what, maybe what kind of information do we need and, and, uh, there, there are some people out there trying this, like the Soil Health Institute, um, they've worked with me and Matt, maybe Alejandro too, but they've sampled some of these longer term experiments, including the strip site, Cobbs, Marsden, and they are kind of, they have a list of like the three best soil health indicators, for example. NRCS kind of has their own tally. Some of them align, but I know what you mean, Malcolm. It is a little bit vague and, and soil health can be used in vague terms. I, I always bring people back to what, what particular function in soils are we interested in? Is it their water holding capacity? That's an indicator of health, right? Because when you're talking about, and the analogy is human health, right? You could talk about uh, blood pressure or cholesterol level. There's different indicators that kind of get at a different aspect of health. So whether it's water only capacity or nutrient cycling or biological activity, there's, there's some consensus emerging, but not yet. Not totally so, are you, so are you seeing the, are you seeing movement of the camps coming together a little bit? More or less, but scientists love to argue. Uh, so <laughs> Okay. Question there. And I would uh, add that even if the science agrees on a set of metrics, then we can always expect lots of pushback from farmers um, in, in the sense that, you know, it, it, it could be a, a double-edged sword to, to actually share that kind of information openly in uh, a, a, a publicly available database. So the one I was, oh, I'm taking my prerogative as moderator to ask a question. So the one that somewhat surprised me, I guess, was, you know, maybe not valuing soil tests. I would have thought that perhaps soil test phosphorus would be a metric that might impact appraised value. Because if we have very low soil test P, that may be something that's going to really impact that next buyer of the land because they're going to have to build that up very quickly into the future and so that was i guess maybe more of a comment for me that i was somewhat surprised uh, that that you know, seemed like they didn't want to use this didn't utilize the soil test that came up in conversations mm -hmm. i think at the training but maybe in some of the documents too soil test p i think there was one person or there was someone that was thinking like you were because okay. that that means that if it's a low testing value, they're going to have to invest money in it, right? Okay. You want to say more about this? No, I, I think it came up during the, the training. Okay. Yes. Okay. And maybe it was all these, these three farms might have been relatively good in that, from that perspective. I don't know. So that's key. Yeah. We, well, we used cooked data. Cooked data. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that, one, one of them was cooked really that big. Yeah. Okay. Right. And. Well, soil organic matter also seems like a measure of what I'm talking about is more of that estimate that we use that. Um, we didn't directly use that, we used more of the practices uh, to suggest that, that those things should be monetized. Great question. So the, um, the question was about. Uh, how we convey the information about soil health to appraisers. And the way we selected the farms, so the criteria we used to select the farms was um, based on their long-term practices. But we didn't tell the appraisers what practices farmers have been using in those farms. Just like uh, anybody, any appraiser 
appraiser uh, would do. They would they just visited the farm, took some pictures from outside, you know, the, the fence, um, and um, based their appraise their, their appraisal in um, public documents. Um, and what they had information about was a battery of uh, soil tests. Uh, and Marshall can uh, maybe comment on that. I have slides with the actual soil tests that we share with them. We did make the, the more conservation practices had higher organic matter. So if they were, if they keyed in on that, which you're right, that could be one indicator of soil health. It changes very slowly, but uh, the real value, probably organic matter would probably be um, correlated with the CSRT value, which is a stagnant, not affected by management. So they were provided soil organic matter information. And so if they had factored that in, that, but they, did, no. they didn't really use that. No, they didn't use that. No. So my follow-up question is, were any of the appraisers then, I think you said this, but kind of like, any of them like potentially interested in learning more about this idea or about taking it to the next level or you know the possibility of uh, doing more to integrate some of this information in the future so the, the background of the appraisers uh most of them some kind had some kind of agronomic background right um, so they were familiar to some extent with fertility tests, not so much with soil health tests. Um, but they expressed that they would be willing to learn more and uh, implement changes to the practices as long as there's a demand for that and the, the rules um, by which they are certified, that they become certified appraisers allow for that. Right now, that process excludes the possibility of using soil health results to uh, appraise the farm plan. Two questions quickly. Uh, do you think the low impacted strain just nitrogen and phosphorus is limited? Yeah, uh, you know, you're saying you're looking for soil technology, but you have a thought? So you want to repeat the question? Sure. So, um, maybe I should hold them. I, Actually, if you just come, I think it's okay. right there. Oh, it's going through there. Yeah. 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 So the question was asked: the low impacted stream, um, in particular for uh, chlorophyll A, right? Because that was more sensitive. Um, do we think that uh, it might be nitrogen and phosphorus limited? Yes, that might be the case. Um, Which would you do you think? We we can't tease it out because they it, the the management practices they they kind of correlate um, so they change almost proportionally but that's where we're getting into some of the stoichiometry to answer that exact question so yeah the um, the the top bars set of bars the green bars the the low impacted stream was a little bit more sensitive according to algae growth um, not dissolved oxygen as much. Maybe it was for now for a second one. Um, the first, it, was, it was marketed as the first soil health conservation unit for uh, last year. And it took a little bit of uh, likely what premium value would have been. But the, the enforcement mechanism was function of soil erosion. And have you talked about or looked at how you might integrate soil health with the structural use that a lot of appraisals may be more familiar with? Yeah, so, so the question was um, uh, easements, the relationship between easements, structural, um, um, structural, structural practices. practices, thank you, and uh, uh, appraised values. And uh, in, in some of these farms, there were structural practices. So uh, there, there were some areas with terraces um, and, for that, appraisers do have a method to adjust value. So that's already incorporated in the uh, business as usual uh, of um, allowed by current practices. Uh, what's missing is the linkage between soil health and everything else. 
So I have one a question here on this, actually this slide, Marshall. Mm -hmm. Were you surprised that the cover crop and the prairie decreased chlorophyll A a similar amount? I was. I uh, that really um, because okay. So I just as a kind of as a backup for anybody yeah. that's interested. The cover crop has higher nitrate in that drainage water than does the prairie. So it might be six parts per million versus less than one for the mm -hmm. prairie. So that's why. Yeah, so that I, I think that that shows you that even as from a, a practical, very management side, you know, just using cover crops, at least from this potential measurement of eutrophication, uh, cover crops are pretty effective um, at reducing eutrophication. Um, yeah, we were surprised by that. I know you've documented the, the long-term effects and yes, I, I don't know what the percentage is. Maybe you know, you know the, the relative nutrient loads coming out of the, the cover crop plots versus the prairie, fertilized prairie, but um, I was surprised by that finding. Maybe you are too. That's why yeah, you no, asked. No, that's yeah. why I was. And I've had, I've had a couple, I, I actually got a note. Somebody's like, so you're telling me cover crop is just as good at prairie as prairie? And, well, you know, maybe not from a nitrate loss perspective, yeah. but from a response to in the a chlorophyll A in a stream. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. That's, a, that's a good way to put it. Any other questions? Okay. Okay, yep, we're, we have reached our time. Thank you, uh, Dr. Plastina and Dr. McDaniel for uh, starting this off. And for those online, thank you for attending. We will work to get the, um, the, recording, uh, the recordings archived so you can encourage others to, to uh, watch the archive version. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Right, thank you.